Right, hello, g- good evening, and uh, and thank you very much for for joining us for this uh, this live Q and A with uh, me, Dr. Alistair Pinkerton, and Dr. Rachel Squire. Uh, good evening, Ra- Rachel. It's lovely to see you. Good evening, lovely to see you too. Lovely to be here. Thank you very much for for joining us, and thanks so much for the for the amazing lecture that you gave, which went out, of course, last Monday. Uh, so now we get, I get a chance to ask you uh, lots of questions about your research and about the, the talk that, uh, that you gave. Um, so hopefully we're now live on, on Facebook, so uh, people will be joining us uh, over the next uh, few minutes. I'm sure we'll give people a chance to, uh, to join us. And if you do join us, please do share this feed onto your own, uh, onto your own channels and and allow other people to, disco- to discover the, the pleasures of these Monday, these Monday night lectures. So, of course, we're now in the second uh, term, even the third term of these, uh, of these lectures. So Rachel's is the second lecture this term. We've got another couple of lectures coming up uh, before the end of this uh, season, before we break for the summer. And I'll be sharing details with you about the next two sessions at, uh, at the end of this one. So Rachel last week was talking about exploring oceans and gave a really fantastic account of the way that our oceans and 21st century international trade is located in particular sites, it's connected through particular networks and is fundamentally peopled with thousands of people, even millions of people, representing uh, hundreds of different uh, countries and uh, and conducting vast quantities uh, of global trade and i think what you what for me anyway what you were doing last week was really challenging particular kinds of received wisdoms and received notions that we have uh, about how how so often international trade is represented to us now i know that not everybody will have been able to join us last week so what i i, I wonder if you could do rachel is just to to hopefully uh, give give everybody a sense of what you were talking about last week just a, a quick resume of, of last week's talk for us. Of course, yes, and thank you again uh, for, for having me. Um, so, so last week I was talking a bit about the, the different kinds of ways that we can understand and think about the sea uh, within geography. So I started the lecture just thinking about why we should even engage with the sea in, in the first place. So some of you may know that the root word of, of the word geography is earth writing, and this has arguably resulted, particularly in kind of Western geography, in lots and lots of literature on land-based phenomenon and different uh, kind of social, cultural, political geographies that take place on land. Uh, And sometimes uh, within kind of geographic research, the sea has been quite neglected. So I just spent a couple of minutes at the beginning thinking through why we should kind of counter that or why we should engage with the sea in a slightly different way. And that might be the sheer scale of it. So it forms the majority um, of our planet. It forms, you know, it's crucial in generating the oxygen in the air that we breathe. But importantly, for, for human geographers as well, it's home to a whole range of kind of social, cultural, political and economic uh, processes as well. And so I, I kind of explored that in a bit more detail through uh, the practice of shipping. And obviously, this is tied into all sorts of themes around trade, um, globalisation, and thinking about how central uh, this practice is to the maintenance of our everyday lives. So 90 to 96 percent of everything uh, in the rooms around you will have travelled uh, over the seas uh, to, to get to us. So it's a really fundamental process and one that, um, yeah, perhaps interacts with us in ways that we don't often think about or, or that we take for granted. We don't often stop and think, for example, where all the stuff that we have around us has come from or crucially how, how it's got there uh, as well. So we talked a bit about the scale of this uh, practice and this um, economy. There's a kind of 50,000 merchant ships traveling the oceans um, any one time, registered in countries um, around the world. And as Alice was saying, it's being a truly kind of international process and, um, yeah, international uh, set of practices that accompany this. We then zoomed in really briefly on the case study of the Ever Given, uh, which was the uh, big container ship that got lodged and stuck in the Suez Canal uh, not too long ago. And thinking about how it often takes these moments of rupture and these moments of I guess it was disastrous in some ways, but um, moments of um, where something goes slightly wrong to bring these practices and these processes to our attention because they're often out of sight uh, and out of mind. And then we kind of moved on to thinking about this as a very people process. So it's not one that is just takes place in this abstract space where these kind of disembodied ships 
uh, you know, draw lines through the ocean. But actually, this is a this is a process that involves people, um, and the effects of this economy on those people uh, are really profound. So we explored the geographies of seafaring a little bit, thinking about the over 1.5 million seafarers who work to keep our global economy moving uh, and to keep commodities circulating around the ocean. And I just explored very briefly kind of three ways that seafarers get entangled within that economy, whether it be spending 93% of their working contracts at sea, ending up kind of getting stuck in circulation with, with the ships that they're, they're moving, thinking about the spaces of ports, so how they exist outside of society on kind of the edges of society and the impact, impacts this has on the seafaring community and also on our general awareness as well of this industry um, and of its relevance uh, to our lives. And then finally, thinking about the space of the ship itself. So how uh, things like advances in technology have made this process more efficient, which means fewer people work on ships. And this leads to all sorts of problems around isolation, kind of mental health difficulties, um, and how a lack of kind of uh, connectivity with things like Wi-Fi being absent on most of these shipping vessels, how that compounds those issues. So it was really just a talk thinking about how uh, shipping and the space of the sea is being fundamental to our everyday lives, but also to the global economy as a whole. And then thinking about the profound consequences this has for those tasked with undertaking this process and keeping it going. Because um, we often talk in geography about flows of movement and, you know, a kind of seamless uh, kind of circulation of goods and, and commodities. Uh, but it's not always that smooth. And it's, yeah, a, an inherently human process uh, as well. So thinking about the sea as a space of uh, lived experience and not just this kind of uh, blank expanse. So that was kind of the crux of it, I think. That's a brilliant summary. Th thank you so much. I wonder, uh, I, I've just put out a plea for, for questions on uh, on Facebook. So please do, anybody uh, watching, feel free to add in the, into the chat and I, I'm just I'll be harvesting uh, questions from there. But Rachel, I wondered, can you just maybe give us a sense of, of how you got into this interest in the maritime world? I, obviously, you're a geographer, you're in the same department as me, but but just tell us, where did the interest in the oceans come from? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it came from a couple of places, really. I think I'd studied geography. I didn't actually do geography at A-level, so coming to university kind of really opened my eyes to what, what geography was and the kind of range of uh, things that it um, encompassed. And I think it, it was just a case of timing, partly, because just as I was studying geography, there seemed to be this, um, what, what academics might call a turn towards the oceans. In other words, a group of geographers were increasingly interested in the ocean as a space within geography and writing about how it had been a space that in Western geography had been neglected because we have this kind of land focus and we focus on urban spaces or rural spaces or you know spaces that are more traditionally associated uh, with geography so i was really just inspired by geographers like uh, kim peters who were writing really passionately about how we needed to kind of reorientate our, our geographical imaginations reorientate the way we kind of see the world to be thinking about the sea is integral to, to our existence and as a space of geography and not as a space kind of outside of geography that exists on the periphery. Um, so it's a case of timing, I guess, with, with that work coming through, but also then exploring, once you start exploring these issues, the range of interesting things that take place there, whether that be through kind of shipping and globalization or uh, seafarers' rights and welfare, whether that be deep sea mining whether that be the historical geographies of the Cold War, there's just so much to, to, to get your teeth into. Um, and suddenly that kind of blank blue space on the map that we're so often used to seeing as geographers becomes something very different and it's enlivened um, in, in different ways. So I think it was that those two things really that kind of caught my attention and made me want to explore this more as a, as a key kind of geographical site. Yeah, that's fantastic. And your work has been really important in trying to draw out the, the kind of the human and the lived nature um, of, of our seas, including, of course, during your PhD research. Do you want to just maybe just give us a, cu a couple of minutes about, about your PhD research? Because that, yeah, that sure. wasn't so much about, well, not always about what was happening on the surface, but it was often happening uh, beneath the waves, so to say. Yeah, definitely. I think that's actually a really important point. So in, in the talk, the sea is very much framed as a surface that things and people move across. Uh, but part of my research has been about thinking around depth and thinking about uh, the sea as a kind of three-dimensional entity that is also still really important to, to geography and to our geographical imaginations. So my PhD explored a series of case studies um, in the Cold War known as the Sea Lab Project. So there's uh, Sea Lab 1, 2 and 3 
And these were undertaken uh, by the US Navy in the 1960s. And they were effectively uh, about enabling um, men or aquanauts, as they were known at the time, to live and work on the sea floor uh, for prolonged periods of time without surfacing. So they sunk these uh, undersea habitats down to the sea floor. Um, the aquanauts dived down and effectively lived on the bottom of the sea um, for up to 30 days at a time in, in some cases uh, without being able to come back to the surface. So it was, ex it was exploring kind of why why they did that, how it kind of plugged in to wider Cold War uh, geopolitics and the sometimes kind of fantastical things that accompanied the projects like training dolphins to deliver mail and bottles of Coca-Cola and things like that. I was very lucky to be, of course, one of the uh, the supervisors or part of the supervisorial team on your project. And some of the stories of the aquanauts, uh, this was this was not a kind of glamorous posting, was it? The, no. The, the, no. The, the accounts that you share are of people who are suffering terrible kind of rashes and yeah. uh, ear hy hygiene, earache, infections. It sounded like a pretty miserable existence on the seabed. I think I think it was very very difficult. Obviously, you're kind of contained within a very uh, small space. Humidity levels are very high. Um, it had impacts um, on the hearing. It was very difficult to regulate temperature, um, and just simple things like they couldn't. When you're at that depth, you can't breathe uh, oxygen as the primary source of gas in your breathing mixture. So they were breathing helium predominantly in the, in their air mixture, which, as you can imagine, if anyone not this is not a recommendation, but I'm sure you've heard people. Um, who have We've all helium. done it. We've all done yeah. it. <laughs> who've inhaled helium and then spoke and it makes understanding them very difficult but this was their voice for the duration of the project um yeah so there was all sorts of difficulties associated with it but also for the aquanauts a great sense of kind of pride that they were you know forging new territory and breaking through new kind of barriers as well yeah i mean i, th I think you're absolutely right and one of the things that certainly struck me as part of your phd research and perhaps this is just a metaphor for our engagement with the oceans is that those aquanauts i don't think most people will have heard of those experiments. And if they have, they won't necessarily have thought about the people. They won't know the names in the way that they know Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. You know, we, we've really reified the space and the extraterrestrial rather than rather than the maritime. And I wonder if that, that's almost symbolic, I think, of the way that the, the marine environment hasn't featured very strongly in, in the geographical imagination. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a really good point. Like you said, outer space was very much capturing people's attention at the time. Also spaces like the Arctic, the Antarctic. Um, yeah, and I think you're right, that is a very apt metaphor because what they did was extraordinary. It was groundbreaking. It was something that hadn't really been done before, but it didn't really register, I don't think, in the public imaginary in, in, in the same way. And I think that is partly because the sea is not, you know, doesn't have that same level of kind of, I don't know, glamour or excitement maybe that mm. outer space does. Well, I think that's probably a nice a nice point to kind of pivot on to talking about uh, about your lecture last week and and about the very contemporary nature of the sea that you're talking about in this lecture. Although, of course, maritime trade has existed for the best part of a thousand years you know, to different levels of intensity, but I mean, there's no doubt now that maritime trade is is at its most intense uh, moment in in the course of human history so far. I think you said something like what 80, 90 percent of the things around us, and I'm looking at computer screens, lights, webcams, microphones, books, etc. around me in my office now, have will have come to my office at least in part through maritime trade. Yeah, and it's even high about 90 to 96 percent. So it's a it's a huge a huge industry. Um, yeah, and one that's really integral to maintaining the way that we live. Our lives and again one that we don't often often think about as well yeah so uh so here we go Let, let's kind of dive dive into and uh, into some of these really important topics clearly the, mar the marine environment the maritime environment is absolutely fundamental to international trade we most of us probably know that although i think one of the things that you point out in your talk is that really that maritime traffic is almost invisible to us you know our, our ports exist in particular places we, we might see the you know, the delivery person on the doorstep, but we don't necessarily think about the processes that it took for something to to arrive uh, arrive at our door. And I think one of the things that I'm really struck by is is when we do see places like ports, very very often it's it, it's in kind of speeded up videos that that attempt to show the highly streamlined nature of ports and logistics, um, that show the movement of cranes and perhaps the lifting and dropping of shipping containers, but they so often 
uh, remove any kind of human life from those images altogether. They, they show technology, logistics moving quickly, but, but just, just tell us about the, the peopled nature uh, of, um, of ports and, and of the, the maritime world that perhaps sometimes these kind of images ignore. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a really important point. I think, firstly, just to touch on um, the beginning of, about, about the issue of kind of ports being kind of out of sight and out of mind and the kind of imagery that we associate with port spaces. And actually, often in popular culture, you might see port spaces as a site for illicit activity. It could be, you know, people being imprisoned within a shipping container in this very kind of um, abstract, anonymous space or, you know, a site where people are having kind of gunfights in between the containers. It's, it's really a space where you see labor and where you see you know a huge amount uh, of work going on and part of that is because port spaces as i mentioned at the beginning have really been removed from society and removed from our kind of everyday lives whereas whereas historically they might have been in places like london or, or big cities increasingly they're very much at at the edge of society and this is partly because of the sheer scale of the shipping operation if you're you know working at a port and you have to unload 18,000 containers and reload them back on you need a lot of space and you need you know the machinery you need all the equipment and you can't simply house that within you know a more populated environment but that has really profound consequences because it means we don't see the people that are responsible you know, the machinery for moving those goods and sometimes if we don't see those people and we're not aware of those people it means that we don't think about them and we're not really aware of the issues that come with uh, this process and that come with the industry that is as Alistair was saying so kind of predicated on representing this smooth circulation, this smooth flow uh, of commodities, where it goes from kind of ship uh, to port, to lorry, to our shops and to yeah, people delivering uh, things to our doors. So I think it's really important to remember that it is a people process, if nothing else, then to think about welfare issues, to think about human rights issues, to think about the labour geographies that are associated with living aboard uh, you know, a vast container ship. Yeah, uh, I mean, certainly one of the what was, uh, some of the stories that I've that I've been picking up in the popular press uh, about the marine world, the the maritime world, have been about exactly those kind of liberties questions. And I think that there have been several cases where uh, where people have been stuck on their ships all through COVID, the COVID lockdown, um, for a whole variety of uh, of reasons related to kind of pay and contracts. Um, and I think it's companies who sponsored particular kind of visas going effectively going into liquidation, trapping people on board ship. Is this something that you've been reading about as well? Yeah, no, definitely. I think it's firstly, it's a shame because we don't really see these things reported necessarily in the mainstream media, certainly on the BBC News or kind of other news channels throughout COVID. I don't think I saw any of uh, that being reported. I think it was the UN and it was picked up on the BBC uh, online saying that actually it was a humanitarian crisis going on. Um, in port spaces or just in ships anchored uh, offshore with seafarers unable to get off, um, unable to, to get the connectivity that they need to communicate with people and literally being stuck for, for unknown uh, periods of time. I think what I also tried to bring out in, in the lecture is that this is an industry that's so, so premised on efficiency, profit making and of cutting the margins as finely as possible. So if a shipping company does go bust, as you were saying, the, the issue of abandonment, as it's known in the seafaring community, is actually... Um, I mean, it's not common, commonplace, but it's, it's common enough that it's a significant problem within um, seafaring, that if a company goes bust, no one takes responsibility uh, for those on board and people literally get stuck um, at sea. And and they have to ultimately pay for their own repatriation back to their own country because the, the entity that has been employing them has suddenly disappeared. It's evaporated. Yeah, yeah. I mean that 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 is that, that kind of really neatly points to a kind of new international division of labour that that exists in in the maritime world, which again you know we we don't really pay attention to because we so often thinking think about the, the the terrestrial world. We privilege that in our in our minds and in our imaginations. Yeah, and I think you can see that even with I think I mentioned this in the lecture, but things like the Fair Trade Initiative, um, where you know there's. Obviously, it's done some pretty fantastic things, but it's thinking about producers at one end of the, the spectrum and then us as consumers making informed decisions about the products that we consume. But there's no reference to that process in the middle or, you know, are the people that are moving those goods from that producer to us as consumers uh, being fairly treated? There's this big kind of blind spot and gap, I think, in the way we think about these things. 
And clearly, you know, when you talk about international trade and particularly via via ships, we have to talk about China, for example, and the the huge export economy that China is, and and where demand is for the goods that are that are produced in in Europe and and in North America, and therefore also the routes that that these ships take. Now, of course, one of those. Uh, one of those routes was uh, was really brought to our attention over the past few months uh, because of of what happened in the Suez Canal with the, with the Evergreen, and with the the, the ship that got stuck, it, it wedged itself between the the two banks of of the Suez Canal. I mean, of course, the Suez Canal has been in operation for. 120 130 years you know something like that but perhaps never before has it come to uh, has it come to public attention at that moment of rupture uh, mm-hmm. as you put it that that moment of um if not disaster but certainly distress when it comes yeah, to yeah. Uh, international shipping routes um one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that you've re- reflected on the kind of the emotional geographies that could have been happening on board ship with the kind of stresses on the, the mm. seafarers who were on there. And I remember the the poor captain of that ship, um, I think, was was there was actually quite an interesting gendered politics around that, too, because I think people were suggesting that the captain was a woman and they were, they were therefore blaming uh, this in inverted commas woman driver on this uh, on this kind of. The, the choking of this of this choke point is that is that something that you've kind of been looking at in 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 detail where you kind of had how, how did you reflect on that whole moment I, I think it's a it's a really interesting point I think the the gendered nature of it I think is interesting firstly because the, it was a yeah unfortunate because yeah the majority of seafarers were actually men there's very comparatively few women that, that work uh, in in those roles um, so yeah, the gendered nature of it was 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 definitely interesting. Um, I certainly reflected on the kind of stresses going on on board that ship. Again, they weren't wi- widely reported. You hear statistics about, you know, how heavy it was being two hundred twenty thousand tons, how many containers uh, it was carrying, you know, the the billions of, of of dollars that it was kind of holding up in in global trade. But again, you you didn't really hear about the, the stresses being being experienced on mm. that ship. Um, particularly as, yeah, there were lots of fears, I think, on board around who would end up being blamed, where the liability uh, would lay. Obviously, no one wants to be the person that gets a ship stuck um, in in the Suez Canal. So that was, yeah, an inherently kind of stressful and difficult situation. And I think highlights as well just how reliant we are on this kind of one uh, shipping route and how mm. kind of um, inefficient it is, really, and insufficient it is for the modern uh, global economy. The Suez Canal was built a long time ago. It wasn't built to house uh, 220,000 ton ships with 18,000 containers on them. So when things do go wrong, it creates you know huge backlogs and um, you know has really significant consequences for the global economy. It certainly does point to the the precarious and fragile nature of of some of these routes, and, and of course that we can apply that to the Suez Canal, but presumably we could also apply that to to Panama. And I mean, I, I know that one of the things that, that, that China has been very keen to explore is the possibility of a northern sea route that would effectively bypass the need to use the Suez Canal. Um, and then that, that draws our attention to, to the higher latitudes in the, in the Arctic, but also the potential environmental consequences uh, of that in a comparatively pristine environment. So I mean, do, do you, can you share with us any more detail about the feasibility of things like the northern sea route at Arctic? It's of course somewhat reliant on global warming and the the reduction of pack ice in the uh, in the winter. But is that something that look that's looking increasingly realistic? Um, I think I think potentially yes. I think there's a lot of people looking to the Arctic as a potential new kind of shipping route and as a route to yeah to avoid exactly what happened in the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal because to widen those spaces is extremely expensive and would be a kind of extraordinary operation. Um, and I think it raises some interesting points, as you said, because for many. You know, whilst most of us conceptualise climate change and the climate emergency as, as disastrous for the planet, there's plenty of people within the shipping industry that see it as an opportunity uh, and that see it as an opportunity to, you know, cut shipping costs, to create a more efficient um, circulation or process of circulation. Um, yeah, so I think seeing the Arctic from that perspective, it looks very, very different from how we often mm. imagine it in the, in the wake of climate change um, and the climate emergency. Yeah, that, that's really quite. That's really rather interesting, and, and perhaps even quite sinister that that uh, climate change is seen as uh, as opportune, 
uh, to those who would like to try and exploit some of those those parts of the world that have been have been cut off, um, including, of course, you know, we can think back 150, 175 years to 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 the attempts to find a northwest passage around the, around the top of uh, North America, um, which of course led to the the loss of of multiple lives at, at different times. But those pot- those potentially could open up as a, a series for the future. In fact, even my time my my Twitter timeline at the moment is bizarrely populated with information from the Canadian Navigation Board. Uh, telling me that I, I I need to keep my speed down if I'm driving a super tanker through uh, through some of the straits in northern Canada. I don't know why I'm being bombarded with these messages, but but I hope you've taken notes for when um, I, I should do. I should pass them on to you. Yeah. I should screenshot them and send them to you. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's information about how Canada are now asking ships to to keep to lower speeds in order to protect maritime life. So yeah, and I think ten knots, for example. There's all sorts of of potential issues. I think that that arise when we think about potential shipping through those regions, whether it's environmental uh, disasters, if there's an oil spill, there's issues around who takes responsibility for those things um, if they do happen. Is there search and rescue capability to, you know, it's very different if, you know, a disaster happens in the Arctic Ocean than it is in, in kind of, uh, you know, in the Suez Canal where, the, you know, you can get rescued uh, relatively quickly. So there's all sorts of different factors that that make that a kind of thorny and difficult issue to think about. And certainly because the Arctic is this space that is imagined as being pristine, it's imagined as being untouched, and it's imagined as being this barometer for the climate emergency, that is, it seems quite distasteful to almost imagine it as, to go on to imagine it as this new economic um, opportunity, when actually it signals that actually something quite yeah. awful and tragic uh, is happening at the same time. But I think it also points out how how these spaces are all interconnected, uh, as well, if you're, uh, you know, a shipping company or if you're a country interested in these sorts of activities, you're not just going to be looking at, at one particular ocean space. The ocean is this kind of patchwork of of kind of geopolitical, cultural, economic um, imaginaries that are, that are pieced together to to form some of these processes and events. I mean, there there are so many different layers to the geographies of the oceans that we could that we could pick into. Um, of course, there's globalization. There's th- this idea of smooth spaces at ports, trying to remove as many um, frictions as uh, as possible. We have the international nature of seafarers and and all of the different countries that they come from. We've got flag states and and where where ships are are flagged, as well as the geographies of things like the insurance. Uh, industry there uh, there are so many really fascinating things that that we could th- that we could look into here i mean in terms of, in terms of flag states uh i mean quite quite famously countries like the dominican republic um are one of the i think the key one of the key uh flag state providers can you just give us an insight how do, how does that system work if you know if you if you happen to know um how, why why are some ships uh flagged under the flags of particular nations and and countries like the United Kingdom, which of course has had a long maritime history, doesn't actually have many flagged vessels attached to it. No, and I think I think that's a really important point. It's one I didn't have much time to go into uh, in the lecture, but it underpins actually a lot of what um, I talked about in terms of seafarer welfare and, and seafarer rights. So there's a, as Alice said, there's a, a thing called a flag of convenience, which uh, ships can fly. So a ship might be managed in the UK, it could be insured in another country, but it could fly the flag of Panama, for example, Panama, Liberia, um, a number of other states being kind of key sites and key countries uh, whose flags are used to to fly on ships. And again, it it comes down to things like efficiency, money saving, uh, and making this process as cost effective as possible without really thinking of the human consequences. So if you uh, fly the British flag, for example, then on that ship, everything must be undertaken and um, the processes must all come under UK laws and UK labour rights, UK payment schemes. Everyone will be treated according to the law um, under which the flag uh, that it sails. So if you fly a a British flag, it's going to make the process more expensive because we have stronger labour laws. We have stronger uh, rules around kind of minimum wages and and things like that and how people should be treated um, and all of those things. If you fly a flag from Panama or, or Liberia, then those standards might be radically different. It means you can pay your crews much less, and it means you can circumvent a lot of the bureaucracy and legislation that might come with flying a flag 
from somewhere uh, like the UK that has kind of stronger uh, labour standards. Um, and it can leave people in all sorts of difficulties where you have a you know one crew on board a ship where uh, someone for the Philip from the Philippines will get paid much less than someone from France. Someone from Senegal will get paid even less than someone from the Philippines. So you get this kind of tiered system on board those ships that is often a result of flying a flag of convenience that enables that to happen. That's that's really interesting. So flags of convenience, and and that can lead to this highly kind of stratified nature of workers' rights, salaries, terms and conditions. Yeah. Um, on, on board ship. Well, that well, that certainly explains it. And you're right. Pan, Panama and Liberia seem to be really really uh, disproportionately represented on the oceans, don't they? And presumably that's because they have they have particularly weak. Uh, labor regulations that they allow in the maritime their maritime space so to say yeah i think partly and i think partly because so much of you know the global fleet might be registered with them that it kind of it almost becomes an easy option for yeah for shipping companies to do that so you might have a, a german ship that regi- um, registered uh, at least flagged with liberia insured perhaps some through something like the lloyd's list in in london yeah exactly yeah so a, 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 an, an operating and operating around the world. Um, I mean, yeah, an, inc- so an incredibly complex geography in, in quite a formal geographical sense. Yeah. So if you just kind of map out all those relationships that spin off from one ship, I think it would be it would be quite an undertaking. And it's, again, that very issue that means when a ship is abandoned or something goes wrong, uh, that means, you know, it's not sailing anymore or a company's gone bust. It, it then makes those questions of liability and responsibility really difficult to navigate because there is that that web and that network of global actors that converge on that on that one space that's that's really interesting i wonder i mean we've now been talking for about 35 minutes so i think just a couple more minutes to go and i, I wondered if I, we might finish on the issue of uh, of the environment um because of course one of the we often think about cars and flying as being really environmentally damaging, but w- what about the the environmental consequences of uh, of shipping? And I'm not just talking about disasters, you know, when when ships like the Exxon Valdez sink, for example. But what's the relationship between between the growth of the shipping industry and uh, and the our ocean environment? Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a really good question. I think it's maybe one that manifests. Um, in unexpected ways sometimes as well. So shipping is is greener or it's more efficient than flying than really any other way that we have to transport that volume of goods through the ocean. So at the moment, I think it's the best, it's kind of the best we've got in terms of moving things efficiently with potentially the least environmental impact, although obviously there's still a lot to, to, to be done on that in, in terms of improving efficiency and preventing that. I think pollution comes in all sorts of, of different forms in this industry. So it could be things like sound, so sound pollution is, is a big problem in the shipping industry because it obviously radiates out into the ocean. It affects um, marine life in really profound ways. Um, there was an interesting article recently, actually, I think, um, in Nature about uh, the amount of collisions taking place between, between whales uh, and container ships because the sound you know, disrupts their way of communicating and, and their way of navigating. So things like sound pollution are a really big issue in terms of environmental impact. And there's also, yes, there's issues like oil spills and, you know, there's moments where we see things go wrong. We also don't see uh, things like containers getting lost into the sea. Uh, You know, so many, I I can't quite remember the figures, but there's a significant number of containers that get lost into the sea every year, which means that their contents do. Um, And there was a really interesting, there's an interesting book actually called Moby Duck, which... um, explores when this happened to a container ship that was filled with rubber ducks. I've heard about the rubber ducks. Yeah, yeah. And the book kind of charts their journey around the ocean. Um, but it's a really interesting one because whilst a duck may be a kind of humorous and novel thing uh, to think about this too, if you imagine that that duck is, uh, you know, a different form of plastic or it's um, oil, or it's something that's, you know, incredibly damaging uh, to the environment, then you can see how it moves and the global reach that then those kind of pollutants and those accidents have. I mean, the, 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 this is all really interesting, and I mean, not least because, of course, with with Britain's departure from the European Union, where we are now talking in this country about in, developing increasingly tight trading networks with countries far further away than perhaps we've been regularly trading with before. So, of course, at the moment, there's the talk about the Australia trade deal and trying to boost international trade from there. So, it, even though shipping may be one of the one of the most efficient ways to transport goods around the world. 
it's not necessarily you wouldn't necessarily seek to try and intensify yeah. those those networks there's still an no, advantage in proximity really yeah yeah and obviously moving something from australia to the uk is going to be more environmentally detrimental than moving something from yeah france to the uk or somewhere in europe to the uk i think that's a that's a really important point I mean, as part of this debate, I heard a really interesting thing the other day, and that is that Australia currently exports a huge amount of beef to to China, for example. And we might assume that they that cows are slaughtered in Australia and are then transported frozen to uh, to, to China. But um, apparently a few weeks ago, a, a ship carrying eight to ten thousand cows, live cows, sank in the Sea of Japan. Um, oh, yeah, which which kind of exposes another part of the yeah. um, uh, of our maritime trade, which is in live animals. Yeah, that's a really really important point. Um, you know, again, you, rubber, rubber ducks uh, are one thing, but I can't even imagine what eight to ten thousand cows um, would would sound like if they were if they were sinking into into the ocean. But perhaps just exposing you know another part of international trade, which is the movement of uh, of live animals, with all of the moral and ethical questions that that perhaps raises for the future as we negotiate trade deals. Yeah, and definitely I think, and it was it's another really good example of how we can be, I think, as a number of kind of commentators have said, sea blind, and we can be really blind to those processes and blind to the fact that even, yeah, that these things even happen in the first place, let alone that they go wrong. So I think, yeah, that's another really important case study. Um, I know I said that we were going to finish, but I'm um, guessing as we're just, we've moved on to talk about um, international trade in the UK. I mean, it, perhaps it, perhaps this is linked, but we've talked about um, maritime trade, but the UK seems to also be investing a lot in maritime security infrastructure with new aircraft carriers. There seems to be at least a rhetorical desire to kind of pivot the UK towards the the Indo Pacific, with the talk of a you know grey fleet, Britain's grey fleet, travelling through the oceans to remind the world that Britain is a maritime power. So at least rhetor- at least rhetorically, there seems to be uh, Britain seems to be attempting to kind of re re explore and reimagine its maritime past and present. Yeah, and I think I think that's an that's an interesting one because historically. Britain, that's something that Britain does, isn't it? It's, it's harking back to, to an age that, you know, we haven't really um, been, you know, we don't associate ourselves with with being a kind of nation that empire builds and it travels across the ocean to, to, to do those things. Um, but yeah, certainly there is this resurgence of rhetoric around using the oceans to precisely do that. And there's, you know, real history and geography and kind of geographical thought of the seas as being this space where you... Um, demonstrate sovereignty where you demonstrate power where you use it as a, as a kind of performance of nationhood or a performance of certain kind of geopolitical imperatives uh, and power plays um and yeah i think yeah certainly for britain that that fleet it, it is really important as an important way of doing that when other avenues of of power have become less and certainly if eurovision is anything to go by it's a... <laughs> <laughs> nil point yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, maybe this will all contribute to uh, to people being perhaps less sea blind uh, in the UK than they have been over over more recent decades. Because, of course, there certainly was a period in time in the past when British people on a day to day basis would have a very clear understanding or, or at least some kind of perception of Britain as uh, as a maritime presence. And maybe through some of this stuff, for better or for worse, whatever you think about it, perhaps it will reorient us somewhat towards towards the sea and its both potentialities, uh, but also some of its risks and challenges. No, definitely. And I think that's also another important point around, you know, yes, historically, we have imagined ourselves as being a kind of sea nation. Um, and to not think about the seas in this way is, it is a quite a peculiarly Western way of imagining the world, you know, for, for a lot of coastal communities, for a lot of island communities, um, for a whole range of, of people around the world, the sea isn't marginal. The sea isn't this space outside of society. Mm. And certainly, in some ways, it's quite a privileged thing to even be blind to the sea. Because if you're living at the forefront of the climate emergency, if you're experiencing sea level rise on an everyday basis, you don't have the luxury of being uh, sea blind. So I think it's yeah worth worth taking that into account as well. Rachel, that is that's a really fascinating point to to finish on. Thank you so much for your time this yeah, evening. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, if you can just stay right there for a second, I'm just going to highlight to uh, to everybody watching from home what's coming up in the the weeks ahead. So next 
uh, Monday. That is the seventh. No, in fact, that's not next Monday. It's the Monday after, because of course it's. I think it's the half term, the bank holiday next week. Uh, on the seventh of June, we have uh, Professor Jay Mystery, who's going to be talking about biocultural landscapes, so biodiversity, people, and conservation in the uh, Rupanumi in in Ga- Guyana. And then the final session of this term is going to be uh, Klaus Dodds on Arctic geopolitics. So that's the lecture will be on the 21st of June. And then in both of those cases, we'll have live Q&A's in the, the following the following week. So that's that. And just uh, also as a reminder, absolutely everything that we record, along with uh, teaching resources that accompany this and other lectures, get placed on the Royal Holloway Geography Teacher Hub. So you can see there the web address for that, royalholloway.ac.uk forward slash geography forward slash teacher hyphen hub. And you will find uh, lecture plans, teaching materials, notes to accompany these lectures, along with the videos of the lectures and the Q&As themselves. So you can use those either for your own revision uh, or to include in your classroom. Uh, if you are a teacher and we hope that those are helpful to you. Um, I know that Rachel and I would both say that if you have uh, any requests for future lectures, let us know because we'd be really happy to try and respond to things that you need uh, for for your classroom teaching. We know that the A-level geography curriculum um, is is challenging and that, that teachers are, are always looking for new resources. We're, ha- we're here to help and we're happy to help. So just let us know. Uh, write to us uh, or, or make a comment on one of these videos and we'll, we'll pick that up. But Rachel, thank you so much for your lecture last week and for this brilliant Q&A. Um, it's a really fascinating topic and I'm so grateful that you've reoriented us away from the terrestrial uh, to the maritime. Oh, thank you very much for your time. I've really enjoyed it. Great to see you. Catch up with you soon. Yeah, see you soon. Take care. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.